Hello, welcome to Introduction to Western Philosophy, um, Phil 101, Section 7, CRN 14636, College of Arts and Sciences, Department of Philosophy, Winter 2015. <sighs> I'm Grant Yoakum. I'm going to be your instructor for this course, and um, actually most of the format of this course happens in this kind of way. Um, I will record videos, post them to YouTube, I'll to some extent be relying on old videos as well. Um, where I've just put things how I want them put. So, um, supplemented, of course, by um, additional external videos, um, some from a guy by the name of Rick Roderick from uh, Duke, and some by a guy by the name of Michael Sandel from uh, Harvard, um, and generally whatever else I come across, um, whatever is appropriate. Um, that's just so that it's not the Grant Yoakum show. It's important that you get a number of interpretations of this material in order to round out your, um, you know, your understanding of the, the conceptual art that I'm building throughout this course. So, uh, the purpose of this video is to go over your syllabus. Um, I've posted this to Moodle. I suggest that you print out a copy so that you've got everything on hand and something to uh, refer to. I, I fully acknowledge that in this information age, uh, this may be the only printed copy that ever actually gets printed. But nonetheless, you should calendar in the important dates um, and make sure that you read this very carefully and um, you, you understand what's required of you, what's required of me, and what we're up to in this and online course. Um, so, uh, this course meets virtually. Um, I am on campus on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, this semester and have office hours from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Uh, my office is located um, in O'Dowd Hall, room 319. Uh, so you can find me there um, on those times and those days, or um, if it's very important, uh, we can schedule an in-person appointment, uh, or if uh, I fully acknowledge that a lot of you might not be able to make it to campus in sort of regular you know, manners, so um, I'm fully, um, fully, fully prepared to meet you virtually via Skype uh, so that we can have a one-on-one -on -one interaction um, through the interweb. Right. So, um, uh, there's a lot of boilerplate that they make me put on this syllabus, uh, the course catalog description, the gen ed learning outcomes and course objectives, cross-cutting capacities, that sort of thing. Um, uh, basically, what I am obligated to is all here. Um, so, generally, uh, the course is designed to get you thinking and writing both clearly and critically about complicated theory. Right. Um, it's supposed to hone your ability to interpret, and most of our interaction is going to be written, um, as you'll see as I go over the course. Uh, the course catalog description, um, which is generally um, the, the, the boundaries within which I, I designed this course, uh, reads, study of uh, the main types uh, and problems of Western philosophy. So it's Western. Right. Um, it's down from the Greeks, more or less. Um, readings are chosen to illustrate the de development of Western thought from the ancient Greeks to the present, offered every semester, satisfies the university general education requirement in the Western civilization uh, knowledge exploration area. So um, that's generally what we'll be up to. Um, I am going to be starting off by giving you some background with pre-Socratic philosophy. Pre-Socratic philosophy is just literally every, anything that's uh, before Socrates. Um, the interesting thing about pre-Socratic philosophy is we don't actually know all that much about it. Um, we have fragments that uh, we get from people like Homer and Aristotle and Plato and that sort of thing, sort of word of mouth kind of thing, but there's enough to sketch out sort of a general situation in ancient Greek thought that sets up um, our, the first of our readings uh, with Socrates in his Five Dialogues. So, um, uh, that is, uh, we'll start right at the beginning of Western philosophy and work up to about um, 130 years ago, um, which in terms of philosophy is bloody modern, right? So, um, that's, that's what we're, so we're 
basically going to be traversing 2,400 years of thought, and I'll be trying to build sort of a, represent, a representative conceptual arc centered around um, some basic questions, uh, which throughout the course will become very, very clear. Um, so uh, the required textbooks uh, for this course, um, you're probably freaking out at this point because it's a big gangly pile like this, um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's, I'm going to try and keep the reading uh, manageable and the cost, and I've tried to keep the cost of the textbooks down as well. There are six of them. Um, all of them are available from the Oakland University Bookstore. Um, I, I, I frequently order through uh, different booksellers, uh, generally if you can find used copies. Um, it's every one of these books, with the possible exception of the essential Kierkegaard, are very, very common. So you should be able to find used copies. Um, I understand that it's possible to rent these textbooks as well. I've been using these same books for a number of semesters, so um, you should be able to find copies on hand. Um, so uh, they should be very findable. Um, so like I say, I'm going to start off by giving you some background in the pre-Socratics, and then we are going to move to Plato's Five Dialogues and read only two of these dialogues, the Apology and the Crito. Um, this is going to be a bit confusing because the title of the book tells you that um, these are Plato's five dialogues. Uh, this is the funny thing that happened. Socrates um, was steeped in an oral tradition and uh, never himself actually wrote anything down. How philosophy got done for him is he would go into um, the Agora the marketplace and stand by the bankers' tables and get into conversations and arguments with people. Um, so, uh, what we are taking a look at here in the Apology and the Credo is um, basically uh, Socrates' trial defense, right, which is um, quasi-ironically not apologetic at all, and then the aftermath of his t uh, trial um, with the Credo. So, in general, the Apology will introduce his um, philosophical and moral position, and the Credo will introduce an element of political philosophy. Um, generally, I think these dialogues are centered around um, the Apology with regard to the importance of political rights, and then in the Credo, uh, the importance of political duty. That's very general, but nonetheless, um, you'll see how this all plays out. So, our starting point uh, will be uh, Socrates after we get through some background material. After that, um, we are moving on to uh, Plato. Um, it, you see how this works is that uh, the early dialogues from Plato, um, who was a student of uh, Socrates, these dialogues are thought to be um, more or less reportage of uh, the, the teacher, the, the instructor, uh, the master, Socrates, um, who actually claimed not to be a teacher, um, but nonetheless um, it, it, Plato's mentor. Right? Um, these are thought to be just reportage of Socrates' position, whereas um, in uh, the later dialogues, I've got to fix that chair. Um, uh, generally, what Plato does is use the character Socrates as a mouthpiece for his own theoretical investigation. So both in the earlier book and in this later book in the Phaedrus, uh, we will see a character Socrates having conversations and arguments with people. But um, hopefully I'll be able to illustrate to you uh, the distinction between Socrates and Plato, because Socrates claim not to know anything, and uh, Plato, on the other hand, developed an elaborate theory that allowed him to ground or establish a knowledge claim. Right? Um, so uh, we will be moving on to Plato's Phaedrus. Uh, a lot of people use uh, the Republic which I've got over on my bookshelf, I'm not going to bother, um, as, uh, as, as a starting point for Plato. Um, well, I like the Republic. We would have to read a good ten books of the Republic um, in order to get uh, to the same point of understanding as uh, we can do in 49 pages of the Phaedrus. Um, this is sort of a funny attention-getting dialogue as well. It's sort of out of character for Plato to be this 
amusing. Um, it, this it, this this dialogue is centered around the notion of platonic love, right? It's, I'm I'm sure you've heard about the platonic relationship, um, or Joe and Susie dating. No, it's just platonic. Platonic. Uh, that's just too bad. Um, what Plato means by platonic love is something distinct from what we in our culture have generally appropriated. Um, in terms of the platonic relationship. So I think it's important that we actually ask ourselves what Plato meant by platonic love. This is one of the two love dialogues, the symposium being the other one. So um, it, then after that, we will move to uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. You can see mine's held together by packing tape and a well-worn copy. Um, there are 10 books to um, the Nicomachean Ethics. We'll be taking a look at books one and two and just a small bit of uh, book three, the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, this is uh, centered around the idea of happiness in order to ground in ethics and actually focuses on the development of character. Right? So um, this is a, a sort of a football strategy uh, to uh, give you the ability to attain that which you want anyway, which is to be happy. Right? Ultimately, it's why we do anything that else that we do. We never do it for the sake of anything else. Anyhow, we'll get into it. Um, that is half the course already. Um, so, uh, two dialogues uh, from the five dialogues, about half of the Phaedrus, and um, the first two in, let's say, half books of uh, the Nick McKeon Ethics, and then uh, we are through with the ancients. Right? After the ancients, and you can, it, like, my copy is falling apart here. Um, it, it's well worn. I, it, this is the copy that uh, I uh, learned Hobbes Leviathan from, but nonetheless, we'll be turning to a modern philosopher, Hobbes Leviathan. Basically, what Hobbes wants to do is uh, lay out a conception of human nature and then give us a treatment of sort of an anatomy of political power. Right? So we'll be taking a look at this work, um, just chapters 6, six through 19, don't worry, they're short, um, and uh, getting an idea for his um, political argument. Uh, believe it or not, this, even though it was written um, in uh, the, the early modern period, um, right around the time of um, the, the limiting of the, uh, the constitutional monarchy in, uh, in, in Britain. Um, Hobbes was writing this. This is still sort of a hot-button topic. I go to conferences, people are still talking about Hobbes. So this is a very important argument in political philosophy. So we have justice from uh, Socrates, we have love from Plato, we have happiness from Aristotle, we have power. Um, from Hobbes. Towards the end of the course, what I like to do is bring things into a more modernish uh, period. Uh, so we will be turning to um, the works of Soren Kierkegaard. And it, this is probably the most expensive book that you'll, you'll buy. Um, I, I never know exactly what Kierkegaard that I'm going to introduce, so I have you buy sort of the compilation of Kierkegaard um, texts here. So uh, what we are taking a look at is um, a, a sort of a short-ish um, essay by Kierkegaard by the name of Sickness Unto Death, right? Um, so, uh, well, it's puppy dogs and ice cream in the first half of the course with justice, love, and happiness. Uh, we turn to a pessimistic treatment of human nature from Hobbes. Uh, we turn to a treatment of despair by uh, Kierkegaard, uh, in which he introduces, I think, one of the more interesting accounts of the human being uh, that uh, I've come across. And um, Kierkegaard is generally considered to be one of the, the, the first uh, movements towards a uh, type of philosophy that we call existentialism. So, um, and it, he's sort of a weird one uh, insofar as he is a Christian religious existentialist. Right? Uh, don't worry, he's not too pedantic. Um, it's, I, I quite like Kierkegaard's work, so I think we're going to have a good time with that. Um, much of our treatment of that text is going to focus on um, just unpacking 
as Kierkegaard does, uh, the first paragraph of um, rather dense philosophy. So um, it, you'll see uh, it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. And then finally, um, I bought a new-to-me copy of The Portable Nietzsche because my copy of The Portable Nietzsche was just as, uh, in just as poor shape as uh, my copy of Hobbes' Leviathan. Um, we are turning to um, a small section of um, Twilight of the Idols, or how one philosophizes with a hammer. Um, if you've heard anything about Nietzsche, he's uh, famous for a number of claims. Um, uh, for example, uh, I believe it's maxim number eight of uh, Maxims and Arrows, the first section of Twilight of the Idols. You've heard that statement, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Well, um, here it is on your page 467. Out of life school of war does not destroy me, makes me stronger. Um, Nietzsche is also uh, rather famous um, for making the claim uh, that God is dead. He's actually not the first one to make that claim. Um, it was actually a guy uh, by the name of Hegel in this book, uh, The Phenomenology of Spirit, where uh, that claim um, originates. But nonetheless, um, Nietzsche is famous for actually drawing out the implications of that claim. In Twilight of the Idols, uh, what we are doing is we are critically reinventing the sort of values that, that, that base our identity, our culture, our societies. Right? So um, that's the project there. Um, so what Nietzsche wants to do is engage in uh, what he calls a radical revaluation of values. The interesting thing is the first substantial section of Twilight of the Idols that we will engage with is uh, called the problem of Socrates. So uh, even towards the end of the course, we'll still be in dialogue with the beginning of the course. Um, it's I've chosen uh, about the first third of that book. Um, so uh, in it, generally what you can figure is that a section of this course is roughly somewhere around uh, 45 to 60 pages of reading. Right? So um, I'm not asking for the earth, the sun, and the moon, um, but nonetheless, uh, we are going to uh, spend a lot of time trying to dig deep into our interpretations of these particular texts to figure out what uh, these, 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 these theoretical positions by these authors are and to, in addition to that, turn a critical view right, to these theoretical positions. I don't think any one of them has it right, right? but it's important to actually engage with the method of thought partially to ground ourselves in the history of Western philosophy, which, which gives us an idea of um, kind of where our culture and where our belief systems come from. Right, including our moral belief systems, our political belief systems, our science. Right? Uh, but in addition to that, this will be an exercise to kind of hone, refine, and sharpen your ability to be critical in your interpretations of these, these fairly complicated texts. Right? So um, it's not my goal to, um, to, to, to persuade any of you to believe as any of these guys do, because like I say, I don't think any one of them has it right, but nonetheless, what we get are interesting, useful, critical understandings of, of, of where values and institutions and um, it, it, it such come from within Western culture, which we're all, to some degree, steeped in. So um, I typed up a course description here. I'm going to leave that to you to read. Um, I'm never quite happy with um, how everything uh, comes out, but it, it generally the idea is that through thinking through um, these issues and uh, these arguments with these philosophers, largely we think through our own dispositions as well and ultimately become better able to engage with the world and in general better human beings, I think. Right? Um, I generally think that's what philosophy is geared to do. Right. Um, and uh, I've tried to choose texts that will hit on issues and topics that are of concern to you, uh, because I generally think that um, if these guys don't help you live your life, it, they, they, they've lost their relevance. Right? There's not intrinsic 
value to studying these these theories. It's extrinsic, right? It's it's instrumental. It's it's their reflection should help you um, live a human life. So um, that's that's sort of a course overview uh, in very rough general terms, and we'll hone that as we go. Now, um, the, the breakdown of how I'm going to grade you in this course, uh, there are basically four major sections um, that are where your grades come from. Uh, first are the section quizzes, which um, I have uh, oddly at the end of uh, my evaluation section on page two of your syllabus. Um, there are six of them, uh, we're 10% each, so that is going to be 60% um, of your final grade. Uh, you see what I've done is I've laid these out so that the, 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 the points for each of these are actually total to 100. Uh, that way you can do simple math to figure out exactly where you stand with regard to your final grade in the course. Um, they're trying to make this easy peasy. So, um, six section quizzes, one for each unit. Right? So we'll study Socrates, we'll have a quiz on Socrates, we'll study Plato, we'll have a quiz on Plato, etc., etc. Right. Um, I describe them this way. Uh, this course is divided into six sections. Each of the quizzes for this course will test the section that we are working on only. That, that is, the quizzes will not be comprehensive. Each quiz will consist of questions totaling to uh, 10 possible points, typically five short answer questions. Uh, that is, asking you to define a term and make a distinction related to a particular philosopher. Right. So um, the rule of thumb, um, I'm not saying an absolute rule because sometimes it takes longer to explain um, the idea, but a rule of thumb is generally about a sentence per point. Right. So again, not asking for this, the earth, the sun, and the moon. Um, I am asking you to um, use language and thought with sort of a scalpel's act accuracy here. Um, because it, it's being clear and precise with our language is going to be the medium that we're working in, right? So, um, so let me see 10 possible points. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Questions will be designed to test both reading comprehension and a, moral, a more general understanding of the ideas that we've studied. Um, that is, uh, the readings and all of the video material are fair game for these, right? So um, if I post videos, I'm going to refer to those videos in the quizzes. If there's something in the reading, you're responsible for that as well. Um, something that I introduced in terms of uh, one of our discussion topics or in terms of one of these lecture videos. Um, these are all fair game for these quizzes as well. Um, these quizzes will be posted to Moodle on uh, the Thursday ending each section covered by the quiz. So on the Thursday that we end Socrates, I'll post a quiz. And um, then by uh, the Sunday, um, you'll have basically the weekend forum. By the Sunday by 5 p.m., uh, you uh, will uh, be submitting your responses to these quizzes to Moodle. So everything happens via Moodle. Um, and uh, on page three of the syllabus, I indicate all of the dates of these quizzes. Uh, for example, uh, your first one is uh, January 25th is the due date. So the previous Thursday, which is, let me consult my calendar here, January 25th. So uh, by the 22nd, um, generally first thing in the morning, I will be posting this quiz. Um, so you will have all of that time. Um, I try to lay out all of the, uh, the requirements for this course so that you can kind of plan your life around them. Um, so you don't have to blow a Sunday afternoon on these quizzes. It's posted on Thursday. You can do it on Thursday and submit it on Thursday and just be done with it and still enjoy your weekend. Or um, if you've got work, you can work around that. I do give you one, two, three, four days um, to work on these uh, rather short quizzes that shouldn't take you a ton of time. Um, I try to be very uh, straightforward um, with the kinds of questions that I'm asking too. Though, I gotta say, um, philosophy it, it requires a lot of thought, a lot of interpretation, and a lot of precision. So you've got to read these questions very carefully um, to figure out uh, what I am asking. If you have questions, you can always email, email me as well. Um, so, those are the quizzes. 
For this course, we will also have um, a discussion forum. So each and every one of the uh, theorists that we study will be accompanied by um, uh, it's sort of an overview uh, topic question that I design. Um, it's I try to ask an interesting question, something that gets you thinking about the material, something that will uh, start a debate and a discussion between you guys, right? So um, you're not absolutely limited by the discussion forum questions, but nonetheless, um, uh, the discussion forum topics will get the ball rolling with regard to discussion between you guys. Um, the discussion forums are intended to be your workspace for understanding this material. So um, again, on page two of the syllabus, I've written up a rather lengthy description for this, which I will read and see if I can't ex explain while I'm going through it. Each figure we study will be accompanied with a discussion topic posted to Moodle. You're expected to enter into debates, offer criticisms, and generally discuss the nuances of the theoretical positions of each of these figures via this Moodle forum. Right? So uh, yes, you have to do them all. Um, I read them all as well. So uh, while you write one post, I read tons of these poses. Um, I'm teaching more than one class right now, and each of my classes have discussion forums. So it's uh, quite a lot of work for me to actually keep up with and um, read through these. But um, it's important that we actually get into a discussion. Right? Um, at the end of the semester, a uh, grade out of 15 points will be assigned based on the frequency, relevance, and quality of your participation. For example, posts like, I agree, or this is stupid without additional com comments or analysis. Um, will be insufficient to uh, garner a passing grade. It's perfectly acceptable if you post, uh, if your post is a response to another student. Right? So um, if you are responding to another student in the forums, that's perfectly acceptable. And actually, it's, I like that because it generates a conversation. Somebody's got to get the ball rolling, though. Um, it's also perfectly acceptable to ask questions about sections of reading or uh, the more opaque nuances of um, uh, the specific figure um, it's so, uh, that we're, or position that we are studying. So um, this is a pile of grades, 15% of your final mark, where you don't necessarily have to have the answer. But you can ask a good question, you can offer a tentative interpretation, you can ask other students for help in understanding this material. You, you see, these forms are designed so that this course can actually become a large think tank um, of interested parties that all have concerns with understanding the same material. So, um, like I say, it's your workspace to work out your understanding of this material. Um, uh, also, illustrative examples that either clarify or call a question to arguments presented by each uh, the specific figure are an excellent way to engage with this study resource as well. So, for example, if um, something happened to you at the mall or walking down the street last Tuesday or something along those lines, um, and it, it got you thinking about Socrates, right? that might be an interesting way to engage with the Socrates forum. If the illustrative example or the experience that you've had calls question to Socrates' position, if you think Socrates' position cannot handle this example, um, post it and start a discussion about it. That's great. Right? Or if it actually makes Socrates' position more clear to you, that might be a good way to illustrate Socrates' position to the rest of the class. Socrates, for example, like I say, each of them. Um, so, generally the idea here is to enhance um, your understanding of the course material. When I grade these things, I ask myself three questions. One, have you posted at least once for each topic? I underline at least there because more is better. Um, largely, I want to see that you're entering into a conversation, so if you're sitting quietly in the corner and only doing the bare minimum, it's, it, your grade's going to be sort of minimal. You know, um, it's but nonetheless, the idea is to create a conversation with sort of a life of its own, right? Um, so, have you posted at least once? Um, more is better, right? Uh, two are uh, the posts substantial. That is, do they show engagement with the material? Um, do they show that you've read and have been thinking about the issues, topics, and texts that we're discussing, right? 
Um, it, frequently, I read posts that show no evidence that the student has even read the material. So um, it, generally, we've got to be on the same page. And um, largely, uh, it's, it, the, the, the quality of peer engagement is going to be um, one of the evaluative um, terms. And then finally, are the posts timely, or did the student wait until the last minute to do them all? This raises an issue um, with the discussion forums. The interesting thing is I leave them open for the entire bloody semester. These things are open until uh, the date and time that your final writing assignment, we'll get to in a minute, um, is due. So um, it, the Socrates forum, which will be the first one that we um, enter into discussion about, uh, will be open all the way until April. So uh, conceivably, you could wait until the last day of class and then do them all. But um, I'm asking myself, um, it, 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 like, are these posts timely? Right? Uh, I do this for a couple of reasons. Right? First off, uh, well, like I say, Nietzsche's text is in dialogue with Socrates and Plato and to some extent Aristotle as well. Hobbes and Aristotle get into a conversation. Hobbes is relevant to your interpretation of Nietzsche. Uh, Plato and Socrates are relevant to your interpretation of Kierkegaard, etc., etc., etc. Right. So it's perfectly conceivable that you could get to the end of the class and go, aha, I had another thought about Socrates. Well, post it in the Socrates form. Right? That works. Right? This is good pedagogy. Right. This is a good way to get you thinking about the material. Right. The other reason um, is that I want to give you full control of this 15% of your final grade right up until the last minute. Right. So um, I don't want to set up a course where if you fumble a little bit at the beginning, you're just messed up throughout the course. Right. So um, these points are here for you at your disposal in order to enhance your grade in the course all the way up to the end of the course. Right? So last call is late in this course. Right? So um, that's the idea. So um, the point of these forums, I'm back to the syllabus here, um, is to generate a study resource for everyone in the class. This is a place to work out your ideas um, in an ongoing discussion with the rest of the class. This is your resource. While I do read every post, I usually leave this um, as a, your discussion space and your study resource. I post myself very infrequently. Right? So um, it, largely as a study resource, it's, uh, the quality of the study resource is going to depend on your engagement with it. Right. Um, this points up something interesting about an online course. Um, it's, well, you'd think that this may be easier because there aren't regular meetings and what have you, and you can plan your own schedule. It requires a lot of you in terms of engaging with the course. It, it requires you to be self-starters with this. Right? So um, I, I've got frequent assignments to keep you current with the course, but nonetheless, um, a lot of it, it, as with any university uh, course, depends on what you put into it. Right? So um, the forms are a good illustration of that. So um, that is the second section um, of your grade. So we're at 75% of the course, 60 for all of the section quizzes um, that we'll be doing throughout the course, um, uh, 15 for the discussion forum. Um, and uh, then there is going to be a writing project, right? Um, and if you go back to uh, the gen, uh, gen ed uh, learning outcomes and course objectives, uh, the last one is to develop students' uh, 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 facility and clear presentation of arguments in writing. Well, uh, we'll be building to this all semester, right? Uh, the quizzes test your understanding of the concepts and distinctions and sort of a reading competency. With um, the forms, develop your ability to, in a more informal set as sense, sort of argue your positions. The formal writing component of this course happens towards the end of the course, where I ask you to write. Uh, how long did I say this time? Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, on page two over to three. 
Um, this will be a uh, 1,000 to 1,250 word reflection paper directed towards your uh, choice between three course overview questions. Right? Um, so it basically, it's a four to five page paper. Right? That I'm asking. Again, I'm not asking for the earth, the sun, and the moon. Um, I'm giving you a lot of freedom with regard to what and how you want to argue as well. It's got to touch base with at least two of the theorists that we've studied in the course, uh, but it's a reflection paper. I'm asking you what you think of what you've taken of the history of Western philosophy pertaining to um, a choice between one of three overview questions. Um, generally, the topics that we'll be discussing are the human condition, um, the nature of freedom, uh, the nature of moral obligation, um, it may be a topic in political philosophy as well, that sort of thing. The overview questions I formulate based on my reading of uh, your interests in the discussion forums or in terms of uh, the really important themes that we discuss. Right. So last semester, and maybe this semester, um, it's it generally these philosophers point to uh, the human capacity to use rationality. Right, as sort of a distinct thing and uh, the unique quality of the human being. Right, so um, each of them actually position the faculty of reason in sort of a distinct kind of way from one another. Right, so I might ask you, uh, what's the role of the faculty of reason? I might ask you something general. In what sense can we be said to be free? All right. Uh, these are all these are all you know topics of human concern and overview topics as they pertain to the course. Um, I don't know what these topics are going to be yet because we haven't had the course yet. Um, these topics um, I'm going to wait until about the midpoint in the course, just before your reading week, um, to post these topics. This will one allow you enough time to start thinking about your paper topics, and two. Um, allow me enough time to formulate uh, these these overview questions. So, um, in general, that's what we are going to be doing. Uh, these are reflection and argument papers, so I am actually asking you what you think. Uh, there will be more on this uh, later in the class, but nonetheless, um, your final project due um, in lieu of a final exam will be this essay, this reflection paper, um, and it's a fairly short one. Right. So I'm asking you to actually engage with this history of Western philosophy that we've been talking about all semester. And then uh, finally, and it, it, I'm not going in the order of the syllabus here, uh, there will be a writing project proposal forum per, um, participation. Uh, portion of your grade. Too many P's there. Anyhow, um, I will be opening up a specific forum um, at the same time as I post the topics where uh, you guys will propose and help each other by workshopping um, your paper topic ideas. Right? Um, so it's um, I, I did this last semester at a, a, a lighter sort of uh, grade sort of weight for it. Um, I liked it because the people that used it generally submitted better, more thought out papers. Um, but in a lot of cases, it wasn't enough points to uh, really incentivize people to use the forum. So um, what I've done is I've weighted it at 5%. And um, basically here you're going to be presenting an account of your argument plan for uh, your paper topic. The paper topic is pick two philosophers and one of the themes and go at it. Right? So um, uh, the, the discussion forum for this, this, this writing project will be you so workshopping collaboratively um, these, these sort of um, the, the paper topics. Right? What do I say? It's over on page three of your syllabus here. Um, uh, this forum space will be open midway through the semester and is intended as a public space to collaboratively workshop your uh, project topics. I just said that. Um, your posts should be uh, substantial argument plans uh, for your project and not just one or two uh, uh, sentence topic presentations. Here, here's what I plan to argue. This is my main thesis. Um, this is how I plan to go about arguing it. I'm using this theorist and this theorist, and here is a justification why. Um, in general terms, that might be an excellent um, post to this forum. 
Um, here you're also expected to help other students workshop um, their arguments with respect to the assigned topics. Um, it's important to note that once you post your proposal, uh, you're not obligated to it in an absolute sense. Right? So once you post a topic, if you change your mind, you're allowed to change your mind. Um, probably be smart and beneficial to actually um, it, follow your thread and actually post a revised topic or something along those lines. Um, you're allowed to abandon your idea, you're allowed to refine your idea, um, that sort of thing. And I note here that uh, refinement of your position and alterations to your thesis claims is often a sign of uh, progress. So five points to that. Um, and uh, basically this forum is going to close a little bit earlier than the other forum. Um, I'm going to close this one uh, the last week of classes, at the end of the last week of classes, probably the Friday uh, ending uh, before the exam period. Um, that way I can tabulate these grades um, in preparation for submission of the final grades because how this works is I get all of your materials and then I have 48 hours to grade all of the papers, grade all of the final quizzes, and um, grade all of your uh, participation forums and submit those final grades. Within 48 hours for more than one class, that's, that's sort of breakneck speed. So um, generally in that 48 hours, I lose a lot of sleep just trying to keep up with it. And anything that I can do early um, is awesome. But nonetheless, hopefully that is um, helpful to you and worth 5% of your final grade. So um, you see 60, 15, 5, and 20 totals to 100. Um, so if you get um, 48 out of 60 on your quizzes and um, uh, you'll know your, your, your um, proposal forum or something along those lines, you'll know what you need to get out of the discussion forums and the final writing project in order to succeed in the course. So it um, should be fairly straightforward. Um, after the evaluation section, um, it, it, I have instructional technology to be used in this course. Um, it's going to be these YouTube lectures plus um, it, any sort of supplemental materials that I come across, sometimes audio lectures, sometimes um, written material that I find on web pages, what have you, anything. Um, it can all be found on Moodle. Moodle is your hotspot. You just log in with uh, your user ID and uh, password that you use for your o OU email. All right. Easy peasy. You found this, so you found Moodle. Away you go. Um, important dates. Um, I've laid everything out very clearly for you. Um, I have a calendar uh, in which all of my important dates for the entire semester are written down. Um, I religiously check this calendar and um, that way I know what's coming up. I suggest you do something uh, the same. Um, I'm sure your calendars are digital. Um, I got one of those too. But um, nonetheless, uh, it's, uh, just, just make note of these important dates just so you don't miss anything. Um, there's also a tentative reading schedule that I go through and uh, sort of chronologically um, put in all of the important dates and about where you should be on your reading as well. Um, I'll be posting the instructional videos in accordance with this um, tentative reading schedule. Um, so that um, it, it, everything will just flow in its proper manner. Now, uh, here is the part of the, uh, the, the, the course um, introduction that I generally hate. Um, I have a general policies section to this syllabus. Um, and I'll start off by saying that um, these policies, well, are, they're directed towards you, are not necessarily aimed at you. Um, I have these policies, my syllabus gets longer and longer uh, because I have to add these policies anytime I have an issue or a problem with um, how the course is uh, unfolded. So um, if I have a problem, I create a policy that all future classes are obligated towards um, in order to handle that problem. I'm a big fan of solving problems before they become problems. Um, the, the first policy uh, is um, a, a large quotation from the student handbook, which is uh, basically the rules and regulations that you're all include and I um, am obligated to. Um, it, it, so uh, you're responsible for this anyway. I just cited here so that it's very, very clear. 
it pertains to plagiarism, and I'm a tough cop on plagiarism. I've had more than 50 cases go um, in my 10 years of teaching for Oakland University in front of the Dean of Students Academic Review Board, um, and uh, this is a serious issue that Oakland University takes seriously too. Of course, you haven't done anything, and um, I fully expect that we will have a friendly, cordial, and professional sort of relationship with one another. Um, this this policy it should not even come up as an issue between us, but it's here so that you know um, how important it is. Plagiarizing the work of others. Plagiarism is, they define it here, which is good, using someone else's work or ideas without giving that person credit. Uh, by doing this, a student is, in effect, claiming credit for someone else's thinking. Whether the student has read or heard uh, the information used, a student must document that source of the information. When dealing with written sources, a clear distinction should be made between quotations, which re reproduce the information from the source word for word, within quotation marks, and paraphrases, which digest um, the source of information and produce it in the student's own words. Both direct quotations and paraphrases must be documented, even if the student rephrases, condenses, or selects from another person's work or ideas. Um, the, idea of work, uh, the ideas are still the other person's, and failure to give credit constitutes misrepresentation of the student's actual work and plagiarism of another's ideas. Buying a paper or using information for, uh, from the World Wide Web or Internet it's redundant there, um, uh, without attribution uh, and handing it in as one's own work is plagiarism. And see, I put a fo footnote to the Dean of Students um, uh, student handbook page there. So my quotation there is referenced. And um, if, here's the thing. O Oakland University has a big honkin' library. The internet is there with all of these sources and information for you to use. I mean, look around. I've got books, more books, more books, and boxes and boxes and boxes of books. I refer to them often, right? Let's calm that down. So, anyhow, um, you, it, all of this is there for you to use. In fact, it, look at the number of books that I've selected for this course. Just there has to be a clear accounting of when this is your idea versus when this is someone else's idea. Otherwise, what you are in effect doing is claiming that someone else's idea is yours. In an academic setting, what I'm doing when I grade this course is asking what you, not what Plato or Aristotle or Joe Blow on the internet or um, someone from a journal article that you found, I'm asking what you have managed to take from this course, what your level of understanding, what your facility for criticism is. And if it's not your work, I, I, I don't know. It, so in effect, by plagiarizing, uh, what you were doing is offering a counterfeit form of material. It's theft, right? So um, I tend to be a very tough cop on plagiarism. Oakland University, um, I teach her because they've got great policies with regard to plagiarism. Um, they tend to be therapeutic, but they do treat it very seriously. It's not an offense that um, it goes unchallenged by the senior levels of administ administration. Right? And in fact, the currency of a university has to do with generating original thought and plagiarism actually exists as the kernel sin amongst academics. So, accordingly, now this is this is me, um, there will be a zero tolerance policy on plagiarism in this course. Um, this is the funny thing, my contract stipulates that I am an expert in terms of um, uh, evaluating your understanding of this material, but I am not an expert with regard to authorship. So I suspect plagiarism, I compile evidence, but I'm required contractually, otherwise I could get in big trouble and maybe fired if I don't pass your, these materials onto an academic review board through the Dean of Students office. Right? This is just what I'm contractually obligated to do. 
Um, there are a number of sanctions that the deans of, Dean of Students Office can um, put on you. They can wipe all of your grades for a semester. They can put you on uh, a probation. They can suspend you. Uh, they can require that everything else you ever um, submit for a course has to go through the Academic Writing Center. Um, it, they can expel you from the university. And so it's it's really quite serious. It's a big list of um, a big list of possible sanctions if if you're caught stealing, basically. Right. Um, course policy for this offense will be automatic failure of the course. Right. So if you were working on a paper, you're nervous about getting a C minus on the paper. Well, you failed the course if I find that you've taken it from somewhere else and submitted it as your own work. Uh, it's just that's to help you with the cost benefit analysis. Um, footnote two here uh, directs you to um, an excellent program that I've taken uh, from uh, the Oakland University Library um, uh, called SiteRate. It will actually guide you through it's an online sort of training program. It doesn't take too too much time. There's a longer uh, version of this program as well, uh, but nonetheless, the SiteRate program is excellent. It'll tell you how when and under what circumstances you need to add some sort of a reference, right? So um, if you don't know what plagiarism is, here's a resource um, for you to figure that out so you can avoid it in this course. You see, you haven't done anything yet. Uh, I, like, it's, I don't even know you. Uh, you don't know me yet. Um, but already the issue of plagiarism has put me in a position where I'm finger waving and accusing even before we've started. Right. So this is this is why I hate these policies um, because it, 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 I'm sure you're perfectly nice and we won't have any problems. So anyhow, don't do it. This won't even be an issue. Right. Um, the missed assignment policy. Uh, this one is here because sometimes, like for example, this semester I had a, um, there, the semester just passed, I had a student approach me in December and say, well, Professor, I'm sorry, I missed quiz two. Is there a way that I can re retake quiz two? Quiz two was at the beginning of October. It's December now. It's too late. It's, we can't go back. I've already posted the answer key, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Um, though that said, the only way my life makes any sense is if I'm a direct descendant of Murphy. You've heard of Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. I'm the first one to understand that life happens. Life happens. Sometimes your dog gets sick, sometimes your kids get sick, sometimes it snows and you're stuck in traffic, sometimes um, it, you, you get sick, um, sometimes it, it, life happens generally. Right, so I'm perfectly willing to work around these happenings of life, and in fact, um, I, I'm in a situation where my partner is pregnant with twins. So uh, this semester, twins are coming. Um, so I fully expect to actually uh, you, you fall a little bit behind towards the end of the semester. Um, I'm trying to plan ahead and put structures in place to handle that, but nonetheless, life happens. Right. Um, all that I ask if you miss an assignment is that you either let me know before uh, the deadline in question or within 12 hours of it. That's very possible, it, 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 provided you're not in a coma or something along those lines. Right? And then we can work it out. Right? So all that I ask is that you be on top of uh, negotiating um, for, for, for missed deadlines or missed assignments. So 12 hours, that's the rule, preferably before. Um, second, uh, next, uh, email. Um, sometimes I email somebody across the hall from me and it takes six hours for them to get that email. So it's not necessarily an instant form of communication. Um, uh, on top of that, uh, there are a lot of you and there's only one of me. Um, and it, these online classes, the only way a lot of you have to con uh, contact me is um, it, it via email. So uh, sometimes I fall way behind on emails. I'm going to make every effort to stay up to date. Um, the best and most direct way to uh, get in contact with me is my post at office hours. Again, Tuesdays, Thursdays, or that hall, um, room 319. Uh, there's a phone in the room too, so if you call the departmental office, they can easily transfer the phone call to me. 
and um, we can have a phone conversation um, during my office hours as well. That's nice, direct, you get your answer immediately. Um, we can have a nice back and forth, right? Um, but nonetheless, if um, also I get a number of the same questions, so if 10 of you ask me a question, sometimes I just put out through one of the, the, the forms for the class a general response so that everybody's got that response. If you have a question, lots of people have that question. I'm not ignoring you, I'm just trying to be expedient with things. Um, one final thing about email, um, Oakland University likes to own everything. I have to email you from an Oakland University email address, you have to email me from an Oakland University email address. All course co co uh, correspondence has to go through an Oakland WDU address. Um, technically, I'm not even supposed to respond to Hotmail or Gmail or Yahoo or Comcast or Verizon or me.com or whatever, right? Technically, I have to only respond to Oakland University emails from my Oakland University email account. So um, it, it activate that account, use it, and um, it also it's handy because it knows who you are. Um, discussion of forum content policy. <coughs> um, there are two principles to this. One, keep it topical. So questions like when are we getting our grades back or how did everybody else do on that exam, they don't belong there. It's an instructional resource. Uh, you should be talking about Plato on the Plato forum, Aristotle on the Aristotle forum, etc. Et um, and secondly, keep it classy. Uh, what we are doing is engaging with arguments. The philosophy talks about all of those things that you're not supposed to talk about. Money, sex, power, um, religion, etc., uh, etc. Et right? It's quite natural that these debates should become heated, uh, but if they become, you know, derogatory towards the person that you're debating against, uh, that's going to cause a problem, right? Um, we have to keep this classy, we have to keep this professional, right? So um, any posts uh, that uh, are in any way uh, directed as uh, uh, criticisms or assaults on the person that you're arguing with, um, any improper language, that sort of thing will be removed and some sort of penalty will be assessed. Um, so th th those are the two things. Um, the, the general idea is this is an instructional resource and should not be treated like a comment section of the freak or anything along those lines, right? Uh, and then finally, even before you ask, um, no expert credit in this course. Everybody should be on the same page and everybody should have um, the same opportunity to get what they earn of the 100 marks that are possible for this class. Okay, those are the policies. Um, it's, I'm sure I quite like you and uh, a number of these policies won't be necessary, but like I say, they're only there because I've had problems in the past. Um, I hate to finger wag at you, but um, uh, these are the things that professionally we just have to keep in mind. And finally, um, the last page of the syllabus um, it should please a lot of you. Um, the grading scheme. What I've given you here is a uh, percentage point to letter grade conversion chart. This is just what I grew up with. When I think A+, plus, this is what I think. When I think B-, minus, this is what I mean, right? So um, just so that it's here and just so that people aren't approaching me in tears in the parking lot, it's happened. Um, it, 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 this is here. So um, look it over and please note that the A range goes from 100 all the way down to 80. Um, so if you get something in the 70s uh, from me, it's B range, it's not C range. If you get something in the 60s from me, that's C range, not D range. So um, this is so that you don't freak out. Um, how this works is I take your percentage grade, convert it into a letter grade, and then Oakland University gives me this chart for letter grade to GPA conversion. All Oakland University's registrar's office ever sees from me is the final GPA grade. Well, the midterm grade evaluation as well. But nonetheless, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the letter grade changes into the four-point grade. Your grade in the course is the four-point grade. So um, as much as you think it makes a difference, it doesn't really. Um, this is just to sort of manage expectations with regard to your grades. 
So, um, hopefully we're going to get into some really interesting discussions. Um, I think I've picked a good bunch of theorists for us to study and some interesting discussion topics um, for us to chew into over the semester. Um, I look forward to interacting with each and every one of you, and um, I'm looking forward to a great semester. So, uh, watch it for the pre-Socratics video as soon as the car, uh, the, the car starts, uh, the semester starts, and um, we will get going on uh, the background material to work us up to um, our first reading, which is Socrates. Alrighty, um, give me an email if you have any questions, and uh, I will talk to you through the semester. Cheers.